<laughs> and then we'll have Q&A. Okay, and people might be asking questions uh, in the meantime in the chat column. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm more than happy to have interruptions at any point. Bernardo so, but... usually uh, does a very good job at following those and bring those up if necessary. But... All right. Perfect. Uh, awesome. Yeah, so great. just uh, focus on the presentation and I will keep an eye on the chat. And if I see any questions, I will let you know. Perfect. <clears> Thanks a lot. So you see, we have a very well oiled labor division across the oceans and continents. Indeed, yeah. In... Yeah, because like Leonid is, is based in uh, North America. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, it's like, it's really like a labor. Uh, it's like what he said is really true. Like, <laughs> um, but you can, do you have um, teaching like in Zoom? Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, uh, it's uh, what uh, HSC calls long distance contract. <clears throat> Some faculty for a variety of reasons are based all over the world, but it all started uh, even before the COVID, but uh, during COVID it became a necessity and sure, can be yeah. continued for some time. Yep. Yeah, no, I think this like this virtual stuff, it's it's really good for, for like some teaching things and for research things, it's great. <clears throat> well, in my in my humble opinion, this is a highly imperfect substitute for in-class teaching guy. I miss uh, live interaction with students. Yeah. You know, when we, we moved back just recently and it was like the first class I did in class when you don't not looking at black screens and like oh, you yes. ask a question and someone answers right. you. I was I was shocked that students like actually answered me. So they exist, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They exist and like they, they actually care. They, they, you know, they do have questions. And you also sometimes have hard time to ask them to show their faces, right? They prefer yeah, black yeah, screens totally. and yeah. <clears throat> do something quite <laughs> whatever. Yeah, yeah no, I think I understand. Right. I mean, makes it more comfortable, I guess. Um, okay, well, yeah. I believe it's time to begin. <laughs> I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, research seminar of the uh, Center for Institutional Studies at HSC University. And we are very pleased to welcome as our speaker tonight, uh, Professor Damian Clark from uh, Economics Department at the University of Chile in Santiago, Chile. Uh, <clears throat> Demian is a wonderful example of mobility, both professionally and geographically. He got his bachelor at the University of Melbourne, which I believe is in Australia, last time I heard. <clears throat> then uh, his uh, master's and PhD are from the University of Oxford, and he is now teaching uh, in Chile. He published extensively in higher rank journals. Uh, and tonight his talk will be on estimating intergenerational returns to medical care, the new evidence from at-risk newborns. So Damian. Uh, thank you so much, Leonid. Um, thanks so much for the invitation and, the, and the, 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 um, the very nice introduction. Indeed, it's very like um, international, my, uh, my background and um, this, I mean, this paper is actually well. It's really um, set here in Chile. I've been based here for for quite a while, um, and one of the really nice things about Chile is there's really good administrative data. So I'll, I'll, I'll sort of dig into this today. Um, yeah. So thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate um, appreciate you, you turning up for the talk and any comments you have. This paper, it's not quite a working paper yet. We have like a draft circulating, but I think we're hoping to have a working paper in like a month or so. So really, any comments at this point would be would be super useful as we're in the like the stages of closing off and making sure all the all the ends are tied up. Um, the paper is written with um, Nicolas uh, Leo Bustos, who uh, was actually recently a postdoc at our department and now has gone to the uh, Ministry of Economics in Chile just recently. Um, and Katia Tapia, who's an, um, an ex-master student of, of ours, who's now gone to Uni University of California, Davis, um, and is doing her PhD there. Um, so the paper, um, where there's sort of more and more concern um, about intergenerational mobility and lack of um, of mobility being sort of a um, a factor which is um, which is sort of um, sucking down the the sort of the um, the opportunities people have to to reach their full um, full capabilities and there's been a lot of recent work in economics a lot of really really good work um, even looking at or particularly looking at sort of um, neighborhood um, effects within within the U.S. trying to understand um, how how to increase um, 
mobility across generations. Um, and then another sort of uh, another big strand, I think one of our like um, challenges as, as economists and uh, particularly in like in public economics is understanding the full returns to public investment. So we, we do we do policies and often these policies get analyzed um, immediately, maybe in the four or five years after um, after the policy. But then often one may think the, the, the long term impact of these policies, when you look say uh, across generations, which is what this paper tries to do, could potentially be quite different and, and understanding both in the short and long run, the um, the impacts of a policy clearly aren't something that a government's gonna gonna be able to do, or like a, a, a particular government when they, when they analyze a policy, they're not going to be necessarily able or concerned about the returns in in twenty or thirty years. But as economists, we need to we need to sort of be able to to measure the full weight of policies over long term, um, long term. And so in this paper, we're trying to do that. We're gonna. We're going to look at a particular policy, try and understand the intergenerational impacts, um, and understand if they're very different to the the short run impacts, which, uh, as, I'll, as I'll mention a little bit, are actually already um, well known in this particular policy. So here the question is: Can an intensive um, and early health investment shape outcome of, of future generations? Um, and I'll, I'll go into this a bit more later on. But there's these um, there's a few papers in economics um, looking at investments which are made very early in life so when, a, when a baby's born if they're born with poor health stocks in particular if they're born with a birth weight at less than 1500 grams they're given a whole a sort of a whole package of, of interventions so they're um, they stay in hospital longer um, they receive um, different uh, intensive margin uh, treatment things things like surfactants in their lungs um, um, different intensive care um, procedures but anyway so we, we, we observe this early life um, investment and we already know that this has impacts on the, the, the baby who, who receives the investment so I'll, I'll talk about this paper in a little bit but um, we know for example it increases the likelihood that these children survive it increases their education during life um, um, it reduces their dependency on the social safety net this is from other other papers in in the us in norway and in chile but what we want to do is now with the data that we have we can follow these babies that that receive this this policy very early in life and we can follow them over generations. So we can see um, a baby, let's say a baby born in 1992, um, later becomes a mother. And so we can see this, this baby received a policy when she was born, um, an, an intensive treatment. Um, and then we see her own baby, a generation later, we can see whether this baby's, baby's more, um, more healthy. So I guess the, the thing I want to make clear in this slide is that we're looking at a lineage, the the person who receives the policy is the is generation one, and we're studying outcomes on on generation two. So this is why we're talking about intergenerational transmission of um, of policy. Um, just some stylized facts. So here I'm just showing um, this data, and this is to, to sort of think about intergenerational mobility more more generally. Here, what we're saying um, we um, we see data where where we observe individuals' birth records, where we can link mothers to their to the, to the children so we see a mother when she's born when she's a baby we see her birth weight and then we follow her for for 30 years and we can see any of her children and so here on the on the x-axis we're looking at a mother's birth weight and on on the y-axis her child's birth weight so these are individual linkages and then we're just collapsing at the um, at the mother's sort of birth weight bin level and what we see is there's this clear intergenerational mo mobility so this isn't like a surprising result this is something that's been shown in um, in a number of, um, of economics and, and, um, and non-economics papers that healthier mothers have healthier children. So for example, let's, I don't know, look at this, um, this mother um, or this group of mothers who's, who's born around 2000, um, 2000 grams. So this is quite um, unhealthy. What you see is that clearly their babies weigh less than those who, who's, who's um, mothers who, are, who weigh say four kilos. But this is the intergenerational transmission, but there's considerable compression. So it's not like these mothers who are very unhealthy are having children that are similarly unhealthy. So it's sure they're less healthy than, than these children, but these ones, these mothers who are around 2000 grams are having children who are on average weigh 3,200 grams. So at least this is, this is some good news that there's this transmission, that there's a positive gradient. So um, unhealthy mothers have unhealthy children but there is a considerable closure of this uh, of this gap and, and this is sort of something that we sim see similarly so this is the likelihood of a mother having a low birth weight child where these are children who are sort of particularly unhealthy low birth weight here just refers to children weighing under 2500 grams when the mother weighs less than 2500 grams it's around 10 percent um, 
a 10 percent chance that she has her her own child being low birth weight and that falls to less than five percent when you're looking at mothers who are um who who when they were born um had very um very high i guess we could say health stocks um and in this paper one of the things we want we want to understand is is this compression or, or what explains this compression is it just some sort of basic reversion to the mean um or is it that there's um this is something that's manipulable by 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 policy um so um Basic introduction in this paper, what we're going to do is we're going to observe all the births in Chile between 1992 and 2018. So this is 6.6 6 .6 million births, and we have an individual identifier for each, each birth and mother. So, we, so, so for each birth in 1992, we know their, their mother's ID, we know their, the baby's ID, and then for a birth towards the end, so 2018, we observe um, the mother's ID and the baby's ID again. So what we can see is that um, we have lineages where um, the first birth, we have the mother ID, which is a grandma, the baby ID, and then that baby becomes a mother in, in 2018. So we can we can link these these births from grandma, from mother um, to baby, and we have these like interfamily lineages. And we and, and for each of these births, we observe micro level records of things like the birth weight of both the mother and the baby, the education of the the grandmother, the the mother and the baby, um, and and various other. Um, um, outcomes and, and, and covariates. So we have quite rich data um, across over 30 years. Um, and of these 6.6 .6 million births, um, many of them don't have their own their own babies yet. So we don't see the intergenerational link. For example, a birth in 2018, of course, we don't have we don't have an intergenerational link for its own baby because it's it's still a baby. But for some of these early generation people, we do have the um, intergenerational link. So we can think that we have the universe of all um, of, of all mothers and babies when the mothers were, were born after 1992. And, and in particular, we have 425,000 second generation births, that is births where we see their, um, their mother um, and, and the baby at a micro level. And what we're gonna be doing in this paper is looking at um, these very important birth weight assignment thres thresholds. So in Chile um, and in various other places, there are these um, quite explicit rules which are which are written into policies um, that say any baby born at less than 1500 grams should be shifted to this particular policy regime and that, that implies various things that i mentioned before like um, they're immediately transferred to a neonatal intensive care unit they spend more, more days in hospital and so what we can do is we can combine these really nice um, administrative um, data with uh, with a regression discontinuity type design given that we have individuals um, with more and less intensive treatment regimes um, in a very fine fine bandwidth. Um, in particular, we're going to take the second generation births, link their health of birth to their mother's health of birth, um, and we're interested in, 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 in estimating the impact of um, a, a um, sort of a, a cutoff um, driven increase in, um, in health investment towards the mother of birth. Um, similarly, I mean, we, so we, we, can, we can follow all these these children in the, in the administrative records, but we also observe we can also link these records to death records and also to inpatient care records. So we observe for all these people, both the first and second generation um, births, we have um, we have their full um, full inpatient care regimes over their um, over their entire life up to the moment um, up to, up to their current age. Um, I'm not sure if there's any questions here, or if if if, if I should just keep going. Well, so far, so good, I guess. No. Yes. All right, yeah. perfect. All right, good. If there's any questions on the basic setup, I'm, of course, more than happy to... Uh, By start. all means, people will not be hesitant. Excellent. Um, yeah, so um, contributions. We think this paper sort of... Um, it it sort of contributes in three main lines. Um, I think one of the like nice things is we have arguably a credible research design, which we can, which we can look at sort of... Um, um, placebo tests. We have high-quality administrative registries. Um, and we're trying to shed light on, on these three things. Um, firstly, just understanding intergenerational transfers and health of birth. And this has been um, since at least this, this Jolet paper from Kari Moretti. Um, we know this is a pervasive, a pervasive fact. Um, and then in, in, generally, what, in general, what I'm going to show is that um, we're going to think in particular about the limits of intergenerational mobility. So there's a lot of recent papers in economics. I mean, there's this Mogstad and, and Torsvig recent um, survey paper. And in the majority of these papers, what we see is that there's positive international mobility. So you have a shock to a, um, 
um, to a first generation individual and that gets diffused to the second generation here what we're going to see is that there are there are limits to that um, so i won't get ahead of myself but um, we're going to find a particular limit where we don't see this this mobility um, the third thing is we're just going to try and um, there's a sort of recent ish i'll say literature trying to understand the returns to early life health programs. This is this Allman paper from the QJ 20, 2010. Bakr Rajan, I'll have a paper in the AER in 2013. And basically they just show at birth and, and in the first generation, these policies are extremely um, um, extremely effective. They, they, they increase health, they, they increase survival, and it's very cheap to, to save lives using these, these um, uh, intensive health treatment policies. And what, we're gonna, what we want to know is, um, are these potentially misestimating the returns if, if, the, um, if the impact of the policies is much larger than, than they've been initially shown? And then finally, this is just, I think, more of like a footnote. Our paper speaks in a very limited way about to these sort of concerns about replication and economics. This, this Bakhadwaj et al. paper uses the Chilean data and the Chilean context, but this data used to be private. It used to be, it used to be impossible to, to sort of access this data. And then a couple of years ago, the Ministry of Health released all the data publicly in a linkable way. So back at Logan et al., there's, I think there's this sort of like concern that there's lots of papers published in the AER and the AEA journals in general, where they fulfill the data policy, that they publish all their code, but the data actually is not possible to, um, um, to test. So in this case, we had the code, the data didn't used to exist. Now the data has opened up and, and um, happily, we, we see that at least in this particular case, um, everything replicates replicates as it should. And it replicates both in sort of an exact way, but also in a broad way. If, if, we, if we extend their paper, which was, which was from 2013, using much more recent RDD methods, using all sorts of different um, cuts of the data, um, and, um, and techniques, clearly their, their results hold. So this is sort of like a footnote thing, but it's, I guess it's at least um, satisfying to know that some of these top published papers, which are published without data, are replicable. Um, broad summary before I dive in. Um, so we, we replicate and extend the main finding that these, these policies reduce um, rates of, um, of death in childhood in the first generation. But we find what for us was a very surprising result that there's negative international transmission of, um, of, of children, sorry, of, of the policy on the children. So mothers who receive the policy 30 years later go on to have children who are in some cases much less healthy than the mothers who marginally missed out on the policy. And this was completely against what we what we'd hypothesized when, when we started the paper. We, we sort of ran the regression. It was like, well, obviously we're going to see a positive or maybe a zero and then we'll be finished. But then we, 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 ran, we ran the results and it was just the exact opposite. We saw a negative and, and, and it took sort of a lot of work to understand why, why this policy, which is so successful in the first generation, actually turned out to make the babies much less healthy in, 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 in the second generation. And this actually, I think, um, is at odds with much literature when, when, when we have this sort of expectation that there's going to be positive intergenerational transmission, intergenerational transmission, why are we seeing negative transmission in this particular case? And what we find, and what, what I'll show more, is that the policies and impacts at other margins that were ex ante are much more expected. And so what we see is that these first generation individuals who receive the policy are much more likely to have a birth which, which survives. So there's the likelihood of giving birth, or a marginal birth, is much higher for the people who are just below the, um, the birth weight cutoff. And so it seems like this policy is sort of saving the, the, the intramarginal birth in the second generation. Um, so it's like for first generation, it makes, makes people healthier, means they're more likely to, have, to give birth, but it's saving these births, which, which probably wouldn't have existed otherwise. And so you see that the second generation birth is, is much less, um, less healthy. And then we, we sort of, we, we, we look into all sorts of other different um, explanations, whether there's parental compensatory, compensatory be behavior, whether there's changes in healthcare utilization, and we can rule out most of the competing mechanisms, which, which makes, us, um, makes us think that the fertility adjustment is the main margin we're seeing here. Um, all right, so I'll, um, I'll, I'll move forward with this. Um, just very briefly, sort of the, the background here, um, Chile has universal um, uh, birth um, attendance and, and birth registration. Um, there's a lot of medical literature pointing to the fact that this 1500 gram threshold is super important. So this is where the very low birth weight um, classification kicks in. Any baby born at less than 1500 grams is classified as very low birth weight. 
Um, and then there's a series of national level guidelines, which was set in 1991, which standardized treatments. And they say any baby born um, below 1500 grams or at less than 32 weeks should receive this particular treatment regime. And this regime includes many things. Um, so, so like to name something, surfactants um, for, for the baby's lungs, um, supplementary nutrition programs, more time in the hospital and screening programs, which last for, for, um, for a number of years. And if you look in, we, we looked at like lots of policy documents and, and this is really like hard coded in there. It's 1500 grams and there's no other similar thresholds at say 2,500 grams or 2000 grams. This really is like an important, um, an important somewhat arbitrary assignment rule for um, to increase treatment early in life. Um, that's all we're going to do. I guess it, it, um, in the most sort of standard um, or the, the, the simplest um, breakdown of the methods is we're going to estimate a regression discontinuity design. So here, let's take some outcome Y of um, generally generation two. So this will be the children of a treated mother. The treated mother, um, so the mother's treated if her birth weight is just below 1500 grams and she's not treated if her birth weight's just above 1500 grams. So we'll estimate a regression discontinuity um, focus on these on, on these babies very, very close to the, the 1500 gram um, threshold. The ones just below are the treated, the ones just above are the untreated, and then we'll, we'll, we'll capture any um, relationship between the running variable and the outcome with, with, flexible, um, with a flexible, flexible functional form on each side. Um, I won't get dig too deeply into the methods now unless, unless you're very interested to know, but we just do sort of, I think what's, what I'd say is like the standard, we, we try and be more or less cutting edge. So we, we estimate this within the optimal band with following the Kalanico et al um, um, criteria. Um, this is from their econometric paper, but also the, this more recent paper from uh, the econometric journal. Um, in general, we're going to do robust bias corrected inference, which is from Colonic Ordal's um, initial econometric paper. And then we're also going to look at sort of the way we specify this. Um, so um, the baseline is we're going to use local linear with separate linear functions on each side of the bandwidth and a triangular kernel to give more weight to individuals just um, the closest to the cutoff. But then we're going to play around with, with this linear, local linear. We can try quadratics and we can try alternative bandwidths. Um, and sort of different types of um, of control, um, um, groups of controls, etc. I think this we have a model in the paper. I'm not going to go into this too much now because I, I did it before in another presentation and I, I, I ran out of time. Um, but one of the key things here is in understanding what this um, this beta parameter. So this beta parameter is what is the returns, which here I'm, we're calling alpha in our model. Um, it's in the paper draft, but I'll, I'll not just try and try and talk through it. Um, briefly but what do we estimate with this beta function when we estimate this alpha alpha hat what do we estimate with a regression discontinuity when we consider outcomes at different points of an individual's life so if we estimate this regression discontinuity at moment t so that a baby is born and they receive um, intensive treatments when we immediately see this baby in the hospital we, we can observe their survival all the beta can really capture is the fact that they've received more intensive treatments and, and that's it i mean we just we just get the reduced form effect of having received a more intensive treatment regime of, regime of birth. But then as this YI becomes an outcome which is observed later and later in the individual, individual's life, um, so like say we now look at um, educational outcomes at the age of 15, then what this beat is capturing something quite different. It's the initial policy re reform plus anything that's responded to that policy later in life. So say for example, the parents, a baby receives uh, the policy and their parents see that their baby's doing well and is um, and is more healthy, and as a result, they invest less in that less in that child and more in some other child in the family. For example, then this um, this this beta this regression discontinuity estimate includes both the initial um, reform impact plus any change in parental behavior which owes to the reform. So it's it's sort of it's not not that it's confounded per se, but that the policy relevant treatment effect now includes any any way that the families interact with with, with the initial policy. And I think what makes this case sort of much more interesting, and here I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go like, or we, we, we can go term by term, but it's in this model that we sort of say there's alpha consists of an initial impact, so the, 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 effect, the, the effect of um, the initial policy is the impact, and then any change in parental investments. But then when you go to the second generation, so now if we, if we look at Y being birth weight, let's say, of a child of an individual who was, who was given this policy at birth, the fact that this child is observed in the data um, at all 
could potentially be an impact to the policy. So let's say the policy makes women more or less likely to give birth or, or it makes parents invest more in their children or less in their children. And that makes it more likely for them to give birth at, you know, at some age. We have this sort of selection into the second generation and potentially what we're capturing in, in beta, as well as being the direct impact of, um, of more health intervention at birth in the mothers in, in the first generation, also owes to the fact that there's they selection, um, selection into birth. So like we, we allowed this model, I'm not going to go into too deeply. The main sort of reason we do this is it, is it lets us sort of think term by term when we, when we try and understand what we're capturing in this, in this, this alpha hat. We're sort of, we're treating this, this treatment effect as like the entire policy relevant treatment effect. I mean, it's like, what's the impact of the policy when people are free to interact with the policy as they wish. But then of course, when you want us to understand um, the mechanisms, we need to think very particularly about what the, um, what the estimates sort of composed of. So I'll skip through that so I can so I can show you some 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 results. Um, data I've said this before we have 6.6 .6 million um, births occurring between 1992 to 2018. Um, specifically, what we're going to do then is each of these births is matched to any future birth. So so of these 6.6 .6 million births, 3.2 million are girls and potentially can have um, can have a birth of their own. And of these 3.2, 425,000 odd go on to have future babies. Of course, these I'll show this this table. What we have some, what we have is something like this: that um, a mother was born in 1992. She only starts to have birth. So in 2004, now she's um, um, say 13 years old. Um, they start to sort of gradually enter the sam sample. So so by by 2018, these mothers are up to 26 years old, and so we sort of gradually recover births um, as mothers age into our in, into our sample. So. Um, 1992, we, we, we get we start to get a considerable amount of births when mothers are 25, 26, 24. Um, 93, um, similarly, they sort of um, age into our sample. So anything we're saying in this paper is relevant or like our um, um, our internal validity is only for mothers up to the age of 26 years. Um, this is, I think, something that we need to make clear. Um, and and of course, like any any so a mother who was born. Into, 2006 by the end of our sample she's not old enough there's only three mothers who were born in three girls who were born in 2006 who are old enough to have their own their own child so we have this sort of this moving window of our, of our sample um, inherent in the way that our data are observed we match the births also to deaths so of these um 6.6 .6 million birth um, birth 60,000 odd die um, before the age of one year and 83,000 matched to a death at any point in, in the sample and similarly we can match these births to their full inpatient hospitalization record. So we, we observe anything that happens in hospitals. We don't observe outpatient care. Um, but of these 6 million um, um, births, we, we, we observe around 3 million um, inpatient visits later in their life. So for some reason, they've gone, they've gone into the hospital. Um, 3 million individuals who go into the hospital, um, on average, 1.86 hospitalizations per, per matched birth. Um, I might skip over this more or less. I just want to make clear some summary statistics. So um, the key thing I think is average birth rate is around 3.3 kilos, uh, which is a standard based on, on basically any sort of in industrialized country. A, a key thing to note is that this policy treatment threshold is really very demanding. So to, to, to receive the intensive treatment, you need to weigh less than 1500 grams and only around 1% of the sample weighs less than 1500 grams. So later on, when I show you some results, um, this looks like a huge, well, a, a reasonably large sample, but actually when we get into the, um, into the second generation births and we get into the, the bandwidth close to 1500 grams, this sample very quickly becomes a, a sample where we do actually worry about um, about power. Um, one other sort of important stylized fact we, that we have to um, sort of make clear here. If you look at birth weight, um, this, is, this is birth weight in our, in our full sample of data, you see a very regular pattern, which is what, what you'd expect. There's nothing sort of um, special about any particular birth weight, um, mean around 3.3 kilos. These babies are all weighed in hospitals. Um, so, like as soon as as soon as a baby's born, they get weighed and they get and they get measured. And, and in Chile, the the bureaucracy is such that this is really like sort of an inviolable step. That they're always weighed, they're always measured, and it's like a very sort of pro measurement country. The issue though is that when people weigh and measure the baby, 
in I think like around 90% of the cases, these weights are rounded to, to 10 gram, um, to 10 gram bins. So if they say, I don't know, you, you weigh a baby and, it, and the baby's 1,498 grams, generally they get rounded up to 1,500. And similarly, if it's 1,448 grams, it gets rounded up to 1,450. So when you, when you zoom in on particular, although this sort of distribution looks quite clean, when you zoom in on particular um, bins, you see that there's, there's clear heaping. So he heaping at 1,300, heaping at 1,400, heaping at 1,500, and arguably also heaping at 1,350, 1,450, 1,550, 1,550. Clearly, when, when we do a regression discontinuity, what we need is for there to be ideally no, um, no manipulation around the, around the cutoff. Here, there's clear heaping, which is, which is going to be an issue in a regression discontinuity. In general, what these papers do and what, what we do later on is what you, talk, we, what you call like the donut design. So we, we can estimate including all observations, and then we can like remove sort of the donut hole, the individuals just at the, at the cutoff, because there's some concern that this rounding might be, might be non-random. Although one thing to note is that 1500, I mean, there's nothing you see similar, similar heaping at different at, at other birth weights. And a baby that's rounded up to 1500 would not receive the policy. So here, I think we'd be more concerned if we saw this, if 1500 was was the limit including 1500, but here individuals receive the treatment if they weigh 1500 grams um, and um, sorry, if they weigh less than 1500 grams. So these, the, this heap doesn't receive the policy. But anyway, we like, I wanna just make clear that this is there and something we're gonna to have to think about when we, when we, when we estimate. Um, in general, I won't, I won't go into this too, too deeply, but we see balance on, on maternal characteristics. I'll sort of I'll discuss this a bit later on. Um, so last thing before I get into the, into the results, what we're going to look at um, is isolating the impact of, of policy receipt of the first generation on downstream outcomes. So our main outcomes is the individual's children's health at birth. So her chil children's survival, birth weight, gestational length, et cetera. The children's health care utilization. And then when we think about mechanisms, we're going to look at the individual's own outcomes. So the mother who receives the policy or the woman who receives the policy, what's the likelihood of her having given birth? How are, are the investments that her parents make in her, in, in, in her? How do they depend on the, on the policy, likelihood of survival to maturity, um, and health stocks at particular moments throughout the life? So here, clearly, we have one policy, multiple outcomes. We're going to um, correct for multiple health correction um, in a number of ways, just because there's, there's some concern that if we're just running lots of regressions on a single policy treatment, we might be finding impacts um, just because we're making type 1 error. All right, so main results. Um, I'll start just showing some like some bin scattered plots. So here, um, these, so this is um, the birth weight of um, a baby. So um, uh, y axis is baby's birth weight of um, um, compared to her mother's birth weight. So these, so these individuals, when they were babies, um, these mothers received the policy treatment. Um, and this is the outcome of, of her children, like 20 years later, her children's birth weight. So what we would have expected or what we were expecting when, when we initially um, estimated this paper was clearly these people are healthier because they receive, um, they receive the treatment. I mean, this is like a, quite a tight bandwidth, close to 1,500 grams. So we would have expected this, um, the left-hand side, we would see healthier children. On the right-hand side, less healthier children. But actually what we see is, if anything, I mean, it's not so, so clear here, but you see like, a jump, at least on the, the, the intercept, um, from around, let's say, 3,000 grams to 3,200 grams on, on the right-hand side. So this clearly isn't consistent. I mean, we're not necessarily sure if this is a significant um, increase, but it's clearly not consistent with the policy making babies healthier in the second generation. If anything, these marginally untreated individuals are, are potentially um, healthier. Um, and this is sort of um, these are sort of the different outcomes we see: birth weight, gestational length. This is the number of weeks of gestation, um, size of birth, and then here, if we look at very low birth weights, this is very low birth weight is what decides if the mother goes into the policy. And then we can say, what's the likelihood that these very birth very low birth weight mothers go on to have their own very low birth weight children? So this would be like the mother receives the policy, the likelihood her, her child is also born at very low birth weight, and so the child then would also receive the policy. Um, and here we see sort of quite clear, um, quite clear impact suggesting, if anything, um, these treated individuals are more likely to be very, very low birth weight. So again, this is sort of evidence consistent with there being negative intergenerational transmission, which is the exact opposite of what, of what we expected. Similarly with prematurity, we see that prematurity gestation less than 37 weeks um, 
individuals to the left who receive the policy are less likely to, to, to are more likely to be premature than those who, who are to the right. So in general, we're seeing things that there's no evidence suggestive of this being positive international mobility, which is what we started out expecting. If anything, it, it points to there being negative um, transmission. Of course, we, we, we estimate that, we, we can estimate this sort of formally. And what we see, this is the sort of point about power. So we have, let's look at the estimate on birth weight. We have 421,000 individuals who are, we observe both the mother and the baby. So this is the second generation babies. Um, and then the optimal bandwidth using the Kalonigo et al. methods is 171 grams. So the, the optimal is we should focus on babies born between 1500 minus 170 grams and 1500 plus 170 grams. Um, and so of these, the 6.6 .6 million births initially, the 420 odd thousand um, who are second generation births in the end are effective observations for estimating this RDD is 811. So 811, I mean, if you think of like an RCT, maybe 811 is an okay sample, but clearly it's not the 6.6 .6 million we initially had. So there, there is like issues of, um, of power. What we see is that there's clearly not evidence of there being a positive impact um, of mother's policy received on birth weight. So what we see is the point estimate um, suggests that those individuals who marginally receive the treatment have babies that weigh 150 grams less than those who didn't. Um, not significant. Here below, we're putting down p-values of, um, of the, the test that um, can we reject? So like a, a low value here would say, would be evidence consistent with there being positive international mobility. So here we have very little evidence to, just, to suggest that this value is positive, which is, which is quite clear because it's, it's a negative. And in general, so we see that using these, these sort of baseline measures, gestation, birth weight, birth length, they're all suggestive of, if anything, negative international mobility. There's no evidence they're being positive. And then certain outcomes, so say infant mortality, what we see here is that it's clearly a negative effect. So for example, this is saying mothers who receive the policy, there's a 0.7% um, percentage point increase in the likelihood that their children die within the first year of life. And so these are like mean outcomes. When you look at particular important cuts, so the likelihood of the, the, their babies being premature, it increases substantially. A very low birth weight, it increases um, by huge amounts. So on, on average, we're talking about 1.5% of the population have very low birth weight babies. We see that the policy increases the likelihood that the second generation is very low birth weight by 4.5 percentage points. So this is like a, a, huge, a huge increase. So in general, all of the results we look at, there's no evidence to suggest the policy has a positive impact intergenerationally. There's quite a lot of evidence to suggest the opposite, that the policy has a negative impact intergenerationally. Um, this is just, uh, I, might, I might skip through this in the interest of time. Um, but we, we can just we can look by the distribution and we see that um, even at quite low in the distribution, so 1500 grams, 1750, 2000 grams, there are significant impacts um, suggesting that that this is quite relevant, um, quite low in the distribution of, of health at birth. So the fact that we don't see this um, this positive international mobility, which is what, what we expected, um, was quite tricky. I think it's like it sort of pushed us back in the, in the paper by, by quite a while because we had to sort of really understand why um, sort of the exact opposite to what the literature was, was suggested has, has happened. And from our like the theoretical model, which I, which I jumped through in this presentation, there's four sort of potential competing explanations we think. One is um, selective fertility, that, that maybe the policy makes people select into um, giving, birth, giving birth, overall selective survival. So we know that the policy initially, um, and I'll show this in a minute, um, makes it less likely that individuals die um, when, they're, when they're treated. So perhaps we're saving individuals who are slightly weaker and that makes their children in, in, in terms slightly weaker. Um, maybe it's that there's some sort of parental compensation. So um, these individuals who that receive the policy um, are doing a bit better in life and, and parents decide to invest more in children who are doing a bit worse. And so actually the initial policy um, effect is sort of diluted by this parental compensation. Um, or perhaps, the, I don't know, the reform means individuals who don't receive the policy, then they, they seek more medical care later on. There's sort of these, these various competing explanations. Um, what we look at first is fertility. And it turns out that fertility is like, is um, a really important determinant of what we're seeing. So this, this plot, this is just taking all of our, um, 
all of all of the girls who are born in this data and who reach the age of 16. And this is saying for each um, birth weight bin. So here, let's say for girls who are, who are born weighing 3000 grams, by the time they're aged 16, what's the likelihood that they've had their own birth? And here we see there's about a 5% chance they've had their own birth. Um, and we, we sort of, we generate these, these circles are just the, the size, the number of, of people who are observed in this, in this, bat, in this, um, uh, this birth weight. And this is the likelihood of, of them having given birth. Clearly there's this, this really, really strong um, um, gradient where children who are born very um, low in the birth rate distribution. So this is like a, a girl who's born at 1000 grams. It's much, much less likely that she'll have a birth by the, age, by the time she's age 16. And you see this gradient um, a birth by the time she's 19, have a birth by the time she's age, age 22, a birth by the time she's age 25. In all of these cases, you see this like this very steep gradient. And, and it's, I mean, it, in magnitude, it's, it's very large. So here this is saying, in Chile at least, the likelihood that a woman's had a, a, a birth by the age of 25 when she weighs 3,000 grams is about, is nearly 50%. And when she weighs less than 1,500 grams, we're talking around 30%. So it's like nearly a doubling of the likelihood they're giving birth. So there's a sort of this, um, this stylized fact that you see this, 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 um, this gradient and then it flattens out over a certain point. But one of the key things that we can even see, I think here, like descriptively is there's this massive jump. Um, I mean, we sort of, we're zooming in here a lot, but there's this massive jump um, just at the 1500 gram um, um, cutoff. So when they're just to the left, um, even though on average, we know lower birth weight people are more likely to, uh, less likely to give birth, we see that there's this like this particular fall at the 1500 gram um, sort of treatment um, um, treatment switch. So these ones, even though these are marginally less healthy, they're much more likely to give birth. So this sort of gives us initial evidence that perhaps this policy is 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 moving fertility and moving fertility by by, by quite a lot. So this we estimate we can estimate this here um, formally using regression discontinuity uh, models. This is what's the likelihood an individual has had a birth. Um, by age X here on the on the X axis, if she received the policy compared to individuals who just marginally missed out. And you see that the likelihood, um, the impact of the policy received on fertility is very large. So here by, by the age of 26, we're talking, about, this is like an RDD estimate, the likelihood that this, this individual has a birth goes up by 0 0.3. So this is like a really, a really large increase in fertility, um, suggesting that this, this um, this is really um, a relevant a relevant mechanism. Um, I might skip over this in the interest of time. Um, so this is like our, our first mechanism result is that clearly this reform is um, is making individuals on the left hand side much more likely to give birth. Um, and potentially, um, this is sort of something I think we still need to be a bit more work on. But potentially, um, it's saving in from marginal birth. So if these these people let's say on 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 or one potential model is that on each side of the um of of the 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 cutoff you're equally likely to conceive a child but on the left hand side it makes people much more likely to take birth to birth to term then probably the births that are being sort of saved on the left hand side are those that are that are much weaker and that's why you see um, there's this negative intergenerational intergener um returns, not because the policy is doing bad things, but because it's saving, saving babies that wouldn't have been saved otherwise. Um, the other, basically all the other mechanisms, I think I have like seven minutes, right? Before I run out of time. Um, all the other mechanisms, we don't really see much evidence to suggest that this is what, what's happening. So one, one concern we have is that maybe um, the reform initially reduces rates of infant mortality of the first generation. So perhaps it's just that the individuals who are um, who are surviving up to the time to give birth are, are themselves weaker. And so what we can do, which, was there a question? No, 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 just no. Okay. So what we can do is say like, question. let's do an imputation exercise. So for all the people who have been saved by the reform in the first generation, let's add them back into the sample and see how extreme um, would the outcomes have to be to, to, to be able to, um, to explain away what we're seeing. So it's like, if people who are just on the right-hand side of the reform um, are, are dying and these are the weaker people we know these people if they had survived um, they probably themselves would have likely had babies who are less healthy so we can add these add these um, these these individuals back in and sort of impute the the um, their theoretical children's outcomes and see if this this can explain away the negative result we see um 
basically what we when we do that um at no point do we see that we can impute outcomes um i mean i'll, I'll just talk through the results rather than showing this um at no point do we see that the imputed outcomes could turn the result around so even if we added in all the people who died and made their and made their theoretical babies very unhealthy that wouldn't be sufficient to for there to be positive interdimensional mobility so in general that that mechanism doesn't seem to hold water um one clear thing we see, or sort of another like concern is maybe people change the way they interact with the healthcare system. So it may be that people who are just on the right hand side of the policy of, of the of the policy threshold themselves, they're marginally weaker at birth, and then they use the healthcare system much more throughout their whole life. So actually by the time they reach maturity, they become much healthier. And that's why you see that these individuals have healthier um, have healthier children themselves. And what we see is very little evidence of that. So we see early in life, this is a regression discontinuity plot showing early in life individuals who are just on the left hand side hand side receive much more um, much more care which is the result of the policy so the policy implies that individuals um, who are less than 1500 grams should receive more more, more hospitalization and, and we see that but then very quickly they sort of converge to the point where both marginally treated and marginally untreated individuals are exactly the same in terms of their hospitalization so it's not like we're seeing individuals who are untreated are now more likely to be connected to the hospital system it's just the, the, the sort of this initial push and then not, not much else happens um, and then the last thing we, we we look at the last possible mechanism is do parents behave differently so like um a baby's born they receive they receive intensive treatment um this baby's parents may may, may then behave differently and here we, we we basically look at all the things that we we can look at which is the parents um labor market responses um we don't see much in terms of the mother being more or less likely likely to leave the labor market what we do see is potentially that mothers of just treated individuals are moving into areas um, with higher expected salaries um and we see some evidence consistent with fathers of individuals who are just treated being more likely to join the labor market though in general this is this is quite a an un underpowered result so in general if anything we see that Parents are responding to this reform in a way that we would expect to be positive to, for, for those who, who are just to the left-hand side of, of, the, um, of the policy. The mothers are starting to earn more, the, parent, the fathers are more likely to be in the labor market. So again, it's not something that would suggest that this could explain why individuals who are just untreated are doing better. If anything, we, we, this, would be, this would be consistent with individuals who are just untreated doing, doing worse. Um, I might skip through that for now. Um, so in closing, um, just quickly, um, I mean, one of the sort of initial concerns was, well, maybe now for this particular group of individuals who um, who received the policy, um, maybe actually there was no initial impact on on infant mortality. The policy wasn't well targeted, or um, or um, or or it did sort of become less important. But we clearly see a very big cut. This is using the, the initial sort of uh, backward wedge. Loken Nielsen method. This is the AR paper that, that looked at this data in 2013. In the first generation, we clearly f replicate this finding. So this is infant mortality of treated individuals. Of, of the first generation, you see that individuals to the left-hand side are much less likely to die during the first year of life, whereas those who are marginally untreated are much more likely to die. And this is a very big increase. This is saying like almost increasing by 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 50 percent the likelihood of, of death within the first year so clearly the policy has bites the policy has it, it, it really is very important this is using their initial methods this is using our like optimal rd methods i mean it's a bit noisy when you use the more recent optimal methods but there's clearly an impact so it's not like the policy doesn't have have bites in at the, um, at the baseline um, we replicate their results they can be sort of we've cut them in all sorts of ways and and, and the policy does have bites um in the interest of time, I might I might skip through some of the, the robustness stuff. Um, um, just to go to some brief discussion. So I think what we have, like what we want to do now is sort of think about um sort of tying this all together. We know sort of all the evidence that, it, that exists up, up to this point is that these policies have really positive return. So Alma et al says in the US. This treatment for, for a marginal baby cost around ten thousand US dollars. In 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 Chile, we estimate it costs around five thousand US dollars to provide this treatment. And what Almond et al. show is that it reduces infant mortality by a lot. So it's like you can you can save babies' lives for a, a very small amount of money, ten thousand um, dollars. But now, if we sort of tie this into our, our new results, how can we think about accrued cost benefit analysis? 
there's clear benefits. One is the increased probability of survival, um, imp improved schooling outcomes of generation one, which is something that, that's been shown in, in, in other work, reduced, uh, reduced connection to the social safety net. But there's also costs that we've sort of, we failed to account for previously. Um, poorer health outcomes in the second generation, which maps into labor market outcomes in the second generation. So these are very big. Um, I mean, sort of the, the cost of saving a life is, is very low, but then it's also important to, um, to sort of note that one clear impact is that you offer these babies this treatment, which is, which is great, but then it means that in the second generation, you're going to have more people selecting into this policy because you have more very low birth weight children. So if anything, um, the, the sort of the baseline estimates over, overestimate the impact of the policy. Um, clearly, though, the fact that it's so cheap and, and that you're saving lives in the first generation means that these sort of second generation costs are going to be um, dwarfed by the benefits in the first generation. But in any case, we want to do sort of a, a formal um, cost benefit, think about um, the returns of these different, um, these different outcomes and just sort of build into this um, the fact that you're more likely to have sort of dependence of, in this policy over time. Um, and anyway, in, in, yeah, in summing up, um, there's this sort of big body of work, um, which is documented returns to early life health, health interventions. And there's this other big body of work, which shows positive intergenerational mobility. This paper unexpectedly sort of goes against all of that. So why don't we see um, intergenerational transmission, which is positive, And why don't we see positive returns um, from a policy? What our results suggest is that the way people interact with policies can be particularly unexpected. So here, um, the, the impact of the policy is positive if you look at the likelihood of giving birth, but then that's negative when you look at intergenerational transfers. Um, one thing I think that's important to note here, and this is something that we sort of, we sort of show in the paper, is even though we have a very large sample, we are challenged on power. So we do this sort of power analyses, and, um, and this, is a, this is the outcome of um, size of birth, that we only really have decent power to detect an effect size in the second generation by the time you reach something like, sorry, this is gestational length. So really we can only detect an effect size of up to a, a week. I mean, I mean, yeah, a week in gestation, which is very large considering gestation is, is 39 weeks. So in general, it's important to like, to, to, to keep in mind that we have, we, we do have power issues here. Um, in conclusion, what we find in the paper is surprising evidence of negative intergenerational policy returns. Um, despite virtually universally positive short run returns, the long run returns um, are arguably negative. And the option of the paper is that the way that individuals interact with policy can be unexpected and the full reach of policies can be, can be quite unexpected. So this policy, we thought, all right, this, um, it's going to impact babies in second generation. It's going to be good. What we found is that it was bad, but it was, um, it was increasing people's ability to, to, to give birth. Um, so this is clearly a good thing. Um, and I think finally, the sort of implications for policy is that what one thinks ex ante, I mean, our sort of expectation in this paper was you should be reinforcing the individuals who margin the out on the policy. These are the people who, who, who you expect to do worse because they didn't receive the policy. But actually what we see here is that um, there's going to need to be some follow-up even for the individuals who receive policy. So there needs to be some reinforcement of those who just received the policy because their children in, in the long run turn out to be to be less um, less healthy. Um, thanks very much. I'll leave it at that. Um, welcome all comments or, or questions. Let's say we're like um, we're re we're writing the paper now, so any any um, comments are very much welcome. Excellent, Damian. Very much appreciated. Thanks. Uh, now uh, the floor is open for questions and comments. Um, I would like to start with a couple of questions, please. Bernardo. Please. Uh, well, uh, thanks, Damien, for the presentation. Um, I was wondering about like some heterogeneity analysis, which, uh, like, for example, if there are like any differences when you look at, uh, well, first, if it's uh, data about like births in private uh, clinics versus public hospitals. Uh, I mean, I'm wondering that maybe like in hospitals, like if you don't have much space, like uh, you have maybe more incentives to round up to, to 1500 and in clinics, if you want them to stay a bit longer, you may have some incentives to round a bit lower, or like, or if there are any other differences between public and private uh, hospitals uh, that you can see in your data that may be important for your results. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess like basically here that the public hospitals um, is 
you generally have lower socioeconomic um, status, um, well, babies from low, lower SES families. Um, what we see, if anything, it looks like the sort of the policy has much more relevance to public hospitals because they're sort of they're very very rigid with the norms. We, we've we've spoken to quite a lot of doctors to sort of understand, and what we see is that in the private clinics early in the early in the sort of the re reform, you see that this policy does have um, does have a, a big impact, but then over time it starts to become less less relevant, and it seems that over time the private hospitals have started to switch away from the fifteen hundred gram threshold. They're trying to sort of like push it up a little bit. So now, um, at least in like the very recent births, in a few private clinics, that they're, they're, even though the government says you must provide this to all individuals born below 1,500 grams, actually you see that they're starting to, to push it up to 2,000 grams and 2,500 grams. So I think this, we definitely do see heterogeneity. It's a bit hard to like look at it very deeply in the second generation because we, we run into like into, into huge power issues then. Um, it seems like the policy um, is much more sort of rigorously met in the in the public um, clinics and um at least in fertility i think one of the, what the one of the interesting results is you see this fertility result that we looked at it's somewhat surprising that you see it is clearer among higher ses individuals so this is um, i mean the, the, we could potentially add this into the paper we haven't really like worked out exactly what's going on there and it could also be an issue of just um of just noise like if, if we sort of cut this the, the, this fine enough by different groups um we're just going to start to get to, just to get noise but there is there's certainly heterogeneity i think it's just a, a sort of an issue of working out a way to like to test things in in a way that's like highly powered enough okay thanks, thanks very much that's clear anyone else any any further comments uh do you have work? a question oh please mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I have a question uh, related to the very first uh, schedule plot that you showed us, mm -hmm. the correlation in birth weights across generations. So to what, I'm not a health economist, so my question might be very like simple. To what extent birth weight is a good proxy for health? Uh, because it seems to me that this correlation might reflect just the genetic uh, or some other mechanisms that just relate uh, body sizes of mothers to, to to children like there is variation in height for instance huh? but it's not clear whether taller people are necessarily healthy so yeah to, to, what, to, to what extent yeah. this is a measure of health yeah I okay yeah I think it's good like, you're definitely right I think like a huge a huge impact here is is genetic like there's a mm -hmm. there's a massive positive correlation um between between birth weights across generations but there's it's also like it's modifiable i think this is just like some, some background so like for example if you take two women who are quite tall um or who or who are born at a similar birth weight and one of these women smokes it's much much more likely that that, that the woman who smokes has has a, a low birth weight baby so it's, it's genetic but this it's certainly behavioral as well um and in general the point on birth weight as a proxy of health um, the evidence suggests that birth weight is a good proxy of health. It's certainly not a perfect proxy of health, but like what you see is if you follow up birth weight over a long time frame, it maps very well into things like hospitalizations. Um, there's this quite famous paper from Rosenzweig and um, um, someone, um, a paper from Restat from around 2004, and it shows the returns to birth weight in education and labor market. So if you like, I don't know, even compare, say, within twins, um, a heavier twin ends up doing much better in the labor market. And, and then like, we know the genetics are the same. So if you look at identical twins, they, they, they share a similar genetic, identical genetic material, um, similar family outcomes, but twins who are, who are heavier earn a, a lot more in the labor market and um, do better in, in terms of education. So I think it's like, it's a good, um, it captures health it's like a reasonable proxy for health. Obviously, there's, there's lots of things um, that don't correlate with birth weight. Um, and it also sort of correlates well with economic outcomes that we as economists um, care about. Because, of course, there's, there's the question like, all right, like why birth weight if it doesn't, doesn't have any, um, any deep implications? But it sort of does have deep implications for labor market and educational outcomes. Okay, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, let's see if there are any, any other questions or comments. Yeah, can I, can I ask Marie, a question? Please. Yeah. 
Thank you, Damian, for a very interesting presentation. I have for probably, again, very simple question because I'm also not a health economist, but there, did you somehow control for, for twins? So, because sometimes like the smallest, smaller weight of children is associated with like uh, being on a, in a twin group and the related question did you how did you somehow control for no, non not completely natural ways of uh, birth uh, giving like if there's an echo procedure then in many cases there are like multiple children coming out and quite quite often echo is associated with uh, like uh, good uh, income status of parents because in many countries you need to pay for that and since you pay like you invest a lot in in that and if you do that you also can invest a lot in like uh, health insurance etc or it's just like small outlier numbers so it doesn't make any sense thanks yep Thanks a lot. Sorry, what was the first, the first, the first thing? I didn't like that. My audio cut out just when you said to be controlled for X, the like the first half. Marie. Yeah, that was about twins. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. Perfect. Yeah. Um, you're right. Actually, like it's really interesting that of this sample, a large, so like in, in the total sample, three percent of the population is twins, but in this particular sample, it's something that's much higher, like ten. 10% because twins generally are much um, a much lower birth weight because there's, there's two of them. So we definitely see that there's more twins. I guess there's like two issues. I think one's a sort of an issue more of internal validity. One's more of an issue of external validity. So on the internal validity, at least what we know is that there's not, we don't see like a big shift in twinning when you move from left to right. So it's like, it's balanced sort of experimentally. Like we, we sort of, I guess we can control for it in the sense that the, that the RD assumptions seem to be met, that like local to the you know, local to the cutoff, it's not much more likely that individuals who are just on the left are having twins and individuals just on the right aren't. But I think where the point is is super relevant is like what's the external validity of this? Because I think if if you want to know, all right, let's say we now we we increase investments in individuals who weigh 2,500 grams, those individuals are so different to these individuals because here, like we, we see a huge amount of twins, you see individuals who are really very unhealthy so i think like it's important for us to think of these these impacts like local to this group which is quite a quite a particular group so uh, yeah you're right um twins um uh, in general just 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 much much less healthy the point on like um so for example you know th this being like selection to ivf or things like this i think for the time frame it's not so likely that we're seeing selection to ivf at least in chile IVF something that's sort of happening much more recently. It's like 20, the, the, like post 2010, early in the sample, there's, there, was, there wasn't so much use of fertility treatments. Um, and I think these like second generation individuals are born to those mothers. Um, but definitely the point on twins is something that's, that, that's key. All right, thanks. Let's see, anyone else? Uh, Damien, uh, when you, when you move to policy implications for assessments of different policies, I think they become a bit uncertain because you don't see clear intergenerational transmission of health and uh, investments in health uh, could not necessarily pay off in terms of better health of children of people who were treated. And, uh, and one possible explanation to mention is that as a result of this early intervention, for mothers, uh, they would deliver less healthy children. So uh, in a way you are <clears throat> working against the natural selection, playing God, if you will. And uh, what reminds me, uh, <clears throat> what this reminds me is uh, you probably need some guidance as to what is good for the society. And there was an interesting field which is called applied ethics. I'm not sure if ever came across that. But basically, this is about uh, welfare comparisons and economies with variable population. <clears throat> and just to give an example, it's, uh, it has very strong Malthusian taste. But basically, <clears throat> you compare two states of the economy. And in one state, you have an economy with, say, uh, 1 million people. And uh, income per capita is, say, 50,000 US. And then uh, you have an economy with uh, 
5 million people and income per capita is 49,000 US. So much bigger people enjoy much lower welfare. So uh, how you make comparisons between these two economies, normative comparisons, welfare comparisons. And uh, so I thought that uh, you might want to have a look at this literature and the names here would be Charles Blackerby and David Donaldson. And uh, you can look them up if you don't find them, you know, I'll send you some references. They did this work uh, a while ago, maybe something like 50, 20 years ago. Uh, so that might uh, give you some, some ideas as to uh, not just to do some very fine empirical analysis, but when it comes to uh, drawing policy conclusions, uh, some guidance as to what is good, what is not as good might be useful. Yeah, this is super useful. Uh, thanks so much, Lena. I, I'm not, I've noted this down, but if I, if I don't find it, I'm gonna, I'll write you. But I, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's like it's super interesting. I'll look into this up, this applied ethics. Um, and I I think, yeah, I think we have to be careful with the way like the the way we set this up. Also, I'm thinking about like sort of general equilibrium and 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 quite like partial equilibrium things because like at least what we were thinking initially is all right. So like let's say the policy has has this impact. We I think we weren't thinking of like you know the general equilibrium effects. Like what is the optimal in terms of um um like should you save babies of course like what we're thinking is let's say this this is what you observe and we know that these are the babies are doing that are doing worse should we target more resources at these people so, so thinking in a very yeah. like right. a very partial equilibrium sense but i like i totally agree at no point have we got some sort of social welfare function we've never we've never listed a social welfare function and i don't think we've even really thought about it like what's the optimal in that sense um so I'll, I'll read these papers i know there's like there's this recent paper i'm not sure if it goes in, in the, a sort of similar line but totally Mal Malthusian by Matthias Dopke, where they sort of think about what they call like the optimal population problem. And yeah. they look at it in like an, an sort of an, an OLG framework. Um, yeah, and I think this, this I don't know, I, I don't know if it's like general equilibrium, but but our paper certainly like touches on that. And it was, I think it was never like sort of a, a, the plan of the paper, but sort of unexpectedly we, we get there. So I'm gonna look into this, I think. Um, well, it's also it's also a bit similar to the debates that occur at the other end of the life cycle. That is, uh, to what extent it's worthwhile to maintain life of old and sick people, because you can invest a lot in prolonging lives, but the quality of life is not going to be very high. And the question of how to efficiently use public funds on healthcare comes up, and I see some similarities between those debates and what you study. Although, okay, that's a piece. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to read. I'm going to read this. I think this is just like something yeah, I'm completely different completely. framework. All right. Um, uh, so that, that was so that was very useful, Damian. Thanks very much. Very informative, and appreciate your work and uh, and finding time to present at this seminar. Let me see. Oh, you are. I'm just going to put my email. In case anyone has any comments, like feel free to uh to send okay. them through. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, thank you so much uh, to all of you. I really appreciate you uh, you coming oh, and, and, and all your comments. All right. We will see each other again very soon. I wish everyone good evening or good morning, wherever you are. Have a great day, guys. Thanks very much. Ciao. Thank Bye -bye. you very much, Damien. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks all for coming.